Josh did a great job of telling us why we don't know what causes IBD, and I hope to do a terrific job of telling us we don't know how to treat it, so we're on from there. My only comment, my only uh, disagreement with Josh's talk is that he talked about the divergence of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and I'm more interested in the convergence of these, whether they are two distinct diseases or really spectrum of syndromes within the disease. But um, it re really set the stage wonderfully, Josh. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about treating IBD beyond symptoms and literally how we don't yet know how to talk about how to treat IBD. And in last week's Annals of Internal Medicine, there was a really nice uh, editorial. It had nothing to, it had to do with uh, implantable defibrillators uh, rather than IBD. But the editorial discussed the differences between evidence-based medicine and personalized medicine. And I really think that the past decade has been uh, focused way too much on the evidence base and not on the personalized space or the personalization of medicine. And I think that that's going to be our next decade of treatment, in particular related to inflammatory bowel disease. And there are just numerous examples of this. Part of the problem is that our largest, best clinical trials are not really designed to tell us how to treat patients best. They've designed in order to get drugs to market. So our largest trials are basically placebo-controlled trials in a broad spectrum of patients. And evidence-based medicine, hence, is the interpretation of these clinical trials that are applied to the general public. But it's not the general public that are sitting in front of us on any day. And we need to consider the evidence-based medicine guys say, we don't care about subgroups. Subgroup analyses are inaccurate. They're, under, they're underpowered. They don't reflect the general population, which is true. But they teach us how we can individualize medicine and individualize therapy. Simple examples being the use of immunosuppressants, where the evidence-based guidelines say starting azathioprine at two and a half milligrams per kilogram is the effective dose. Well, in an era where we understand the genetics and the pharmacogenetics and how azathioprine is metabolized, and, no, and Marla has really led the field in this, it's not acceptable to think about um, one dose for a population of patients when there is a um, polymorphism in how we metabolize it. Similarly, uh, examples from biologic therapy. We are uh, translating clinical trials that say that we dose individuals on a specific interval. Well, while that may be fine as a mean uh, approach to the average patient, we're finding that it's inadequate on an individual patient basis. So we're beginning to learn about this. And the next step is going to be applying it in prospective manners. And we haven't done that yet. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is somewhat speculative and hopefully will allow us to design appropriate stu uh, studies more on an individualized basis uh, in the future. So when we're thinking about treating IBD more smartly, there are a number of different uh, considerations that we need to keep in mind. Um, the personalization will depend on, yes, the severity at presentation, but more importantly, on the prognosis. We can have a patient who has very severe symptoms, uh, and they're started on therapy, corticosteroids perhaps, and within a few days, they may, ha may have an illumination of their symptoms and feel better. But that's not telling us what their prognosis is for long-term management. And as we begin to apply more therapies and an aggressive approach to patients who warrant it, we need to consider these factors. We're also recognizing over the past several years what Dave Rubin and others have demonstrated is that the endoscopic appearance, the mucosal appearance of the disease is not always reflected by symptoms. And we see it both ways. We see patients who have no symptoms, and we scope them, and they have lousy-looking mucosa. And we see it the opposite. We see people who have a lot of symptoms in either mild or no active disease. And we need to keep that in mind uh, as we're 
advancing towards therapy. In the future, we are going to be speaking more about biologic remissions than clinical remissions. And that's because of these discrepancies between the biologic activity and the symptoms that individuals report back to us. This is going to require, as we're going to hear more today, about adherence, getting patients to continue on therapy, get them to understand and communicate with us the rationale of why we're treating and monitoring uh, therapies along the way. And of course, we're also going to need to consider economics, because while in the past, the majority of costs for inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, have been hospitalizations and surgeries. With the advent of biologic therapies that have really increased outpatient costs, we need to be considering of the total costs of patients, and not just the cost of medicine, but as Russ Cohn has pointed out many times, we have to consider the indirect costs. How much does it cost for a patient's spouse to come with them for a colonoscopy or procedure or visit? How much time is off uh, for this? How much time do people lose from work or from school along the course of their disease? As of today, we're still talking about the same goals that we've had before. Those are inducing and maintaining clinical remissions. We do know we can go deeper with that. We've identified that mucosal healing, while it is a goal, it's not always achievable, and we're not quite certain how to distinguish benefits of mucosal healing in a patient who is in a clinical remission. But we do know from David and other individuals' work that patients who have a healed mucosa are going to have a better long-term course. They're less likely to develop dysplasia. They're less likely to relapse on their maintenance therapies. We also need to be aware of preventing complications related to the disease, of course, and also therapies. And many of the current PQRS guidelines, did I say it right, is it PQRS? guidelines are really preventing complications related to our therapies, corticosteroids and biologic therapies, as we're going to learn also later today. And to this point, we've tried to optimize timing of surgery in the patients who need it with ulcerative colitis, which is about 20% of patients with ulcerative colitis, and to date, about 50% of patients with Crohn's disease. We want to do it at the optimal time for the patients in their course and to prevent subsequent complications. So we need to understand what is the course of these diseases if we're going to try and modify it. Now, at presentation, the majority of patients with ulcerative colitis are really going to have moderate to what we would consider moderate to severe symptoms. Only about 10 or 20 percent of patients will present with just minor bleeding. And often they don't come to the gastroenterologist first. They may actually talk to the gynecologist if it's a woman. They may go to a colorectal surgeon if they think they have hemorrhoids. Those are patients with milder disease. Patients presenting to gastroenterologists tend to have more moderate to severe disease with ulcerative colitis. And we do have a good um, opportunity to treat them, and we do have effective therapies, so that if you follow those patients out for a year, and this is in a community practice, uh, half of the patients are in a clinical remission and have no symptoms. Only about 20% of patients are continuing to have low activity, and a smaller percentage actually have persistent or what we would consider refractory disease. But despite our ability to treat these patients, there still is a persisting risk of colectomy in population series. And in particular, once patients require corticosteroids, within the next year, up to 30% of patients in community practices are going to require surgery for ulcerative colitis. So we can begin to identify some of the prognostic factors in ulcerative colitis that are prognostic for a bad course, meaning an earlier need for surgery for colectomy along the way or for uh, continued uh, aggressive medical therapy. And many of these features are pretty intuitive. You know it when you see it because they're sick people. The sicker they are, the deeper the ulcers they have, the lower the albumin, the more likely that they're going to need surgery along the way uh, for ulcerative colitis. These are the individuals that we need to focus on for our early and more aggressive approaches, but 
they're pretty much deserving of it by the basis of how sick they are at that time. Crohn's disease is a bit more subtle, as we are very much aware. There is a bigger discrepancy between symptoms and structural damage or disease in the mucosa in Crohn's disease, such that patients may have intermittent flare-ups of symptoms, but each one of those flare-ups is associated with progressive transmural disease activity, which eventually is going to lead to stricturing or fistulization, which accounts for the 80% of patients who require surgery along the course of their Crohn's disease. The key in the future is to predict who's going to have a bad course, as I'll show you a little bit later, and who's going to have a mild or persisting mild course of disease so that we can focus more aggressive and perhaps more effective therapies on the patients who re will require them to modify their disease course, but we still recognize that there is about 20% of patients with Crohn's disease who are going to have a mild course along the way and probably never are going to require more intensive therapies. Now the next two slides point out the discrepancy between symptoms and either biologic parameters or endoscopy in Crohn's disease. And this is a, a prospective series of patients followed in France that compared the endoscopic index of severity versus symptoms. And you can see that there's virtually no correlation. And we all see this in our practice all the time in Crohn's disease, where we see more or less lesions that poorly correlate with the symptoms of the patients at that time. Now, one of the things that's important about these lesions is location, location, location. If a patient has rectal lesions, they're more likely to be symptomatic than patients who have more proximal lesions. And similarly, there's a very poor correlation between symptoms and C-reactive protein, a biologic marker of inflammation. We can use CRP to kind of classify patients if they're asymptomatic and they have an elevated CRP, those individuals are more likely to flare up in the future. So we can use CRP as a prognostic manner. On the other hand, patients without symptoms and normal CRP are usually considered to be in what we would call a deeper remission. To this point, we've had a step-up management approach to patients. We use the least potent therapies according to the symptoms of the patients at presentation. What we do is we step up according to whether or not the medication works or according to severity of symptoms, not prognosis, but severity of symptoms at the present time. Now the problem is the step-up approach has some benefits but also certain deficiencies. Yes, indeed, we're treating patients with milder therapies that may be less expensive and less uh, toxic along the way, that may minimize their short-term side effects, and it may be cost-effective short-term, but we're uncertain whether this is actually cost-effective on a long-term basis. And the disadvantages is that are, are that patients have to earn a more effective therapy. In other words, we have to go through mesalamine or uh, topical steroids in patients who may not be responding and prolonging their period of time of illness. And this, we may ask questions along the way about for uh, a patient presenting, a young woman perhaps, presenting with moderate ulcerative colitis a week before her wedding or two weeks before the wedding. We're conflicted if we're going to give therapies that are going to be much more effective, like giving them steroids, but cause side effects so they don't fit into their wedding dress uh, in the subsequent weeks. We're always having to balance that. We need to maintain their quality of life, and deferring effective therapy is going to reduce that period of poor or increase the period of poor, poor quality of life. This step-up approach has not yet affected the risks of hospitalizations or surgeries for patients, and just as many patients require surgery, as I will show you in a subsequent slide. And I will tell you that even with the advent of biologic therapies, the anti-TNF therapies and anti-adhesion molecules, what I think we're doing by our current positioning 
of those therapies, which is in patients who are not responding to A, B, C, D, or E, and then in advocating biologic therapies, what we're really doing in Crohn's is kicking the can down the road. Because what we're getting is we're not getting surgeries in the first year, but the surgical rate five years after inducing or using biologics is no different. We're using them too late in the course of the disease, and hence we're not modifying the progression of these diseases. And this is an example of a study that was uh, reported about uh, eight years ago, uh, looking at a French population uh, along the lines of when immunosuppressives were added. And in the 70s and 80s, there wasn't much use of azathioprine in France. But as you can see, by the early 2000s, up to 60% of patients with Crohn's disease were treated with biologic therapy, with, excuse me, with immunosuppressive therapies. And what they found was that despite that increased use of, bi of immunosuppressives, there was no change in the surgical rate. Now, one could argue that they have been using the immunosuppressives too late, but I have to admit there are going to be two articles published. One is just published in gastroenterology, and another will soon be published in experiences from France and from Spain with the early use of azathioprine in patient populations, and they did not show statistically significant differences with the early use of azathioprine. Now, to me, that's an evidence-type observation, and it's not individualized. Because do we know that the patients were optimized according to their dose? Azathioprine, in my view, is not an inductive agent, as the Sonic study showed in, in Crohn's disease. Um, azathioprine is a maintenance agent after a steroid-induced remission. It wasn't used that way. But in any event, there is questions regarding when we should be administering uh, immunosuppressives. And I've editorialized that uh, recently. With Crohn's disease, similar to ulcerative colitis, there are a number of prognostic factors that have been identified regarding a poor prognosis for course, however you want to define the course. Early need for surgery, steroid, frequent steroid uses, or complications. And those predictors have been pretty much uniform in several different observational series. Early disease may be associated with more uh, extensive disease, not necessarily more complicated. Uh, Dr. Bernstein's group in Manitoba recently looked at his population series and indeed found more extensive Crohn's disease in young age, but not necessarily more progressive. Small bowel is a bad prognosis because those individuals more often require surgery, particularly stricturing ileal disease. Perianal disease is a bad prognosis, need for steroids in the beginning. In other words, it's a bad prognosis if the patients have a bad prognosis. Smoking is bad, and we've also seen that's not listed here, deep ulcerations. Just like ulcerative colitis, the presence not of little apathy, but deep ulcers is a, a sign that patients are going to have a poor prognosis. What we've learned along these ways is that similar to other diseases, early treatment, early in the course of the disease, no matter what therapy we're using, is going to be more effective. And we have data from uh, the biologics. This is data with adalumumab from what's known as the CHARM study in Crohn's disease, looking at the absolute response rate in pink uh, with adalumumab compared to green and placebo. And although there were differences independent of the disease duration, if you look at the absolute response rate in patients with a shorter duration of disease, in other words, before they're developing progressive structural damage, the outcomes overall are better than patients who have a longer disease duration. We've seen that in other studies, and it's pretty much ubiquitous across the biologics, that the earlier the biologics are introduced, the better the absolute response rate. Even though you can show differences from placebo independent of the duration of the disease, the overall response rate, which is what we're really interested in our patients, is actually better with shorter duration of disease. And that's, of course, because in Crohn's disease, there's a lot below the surface. 
It's like an iceberg. The symptoms are only the tip of the iceberg. What's below that is the ultimate structural damage, the transmural disease that's causing the stricturing and fistulization that may not have immediate symptoms. And this is very similar to, a disease, to rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, there is a discrepancy between symptoms and inflammation and uh, progressive joint damage. And they can actually be divergent, such that in burned out rheumatoid arthritis, patients may have a lot of joint deformity and destruction, but they may not have active inflammation. Whereas early in the course of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, there's a lot of joint swelling and tenderness even before there's uh, joint destruction and joint space narrowing. So there are a couple other diseases where focusing on targets of response have become critically important. And we're heading to that direction in both Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis. But we still have some problems in identifying what the targets are both along the way and the ultimate targets, be it clinical, endoscopic, histologic, or biologic remissions for the patients. But examples of treating to target include uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, and rheumatoid arthritis. And these are examples. I give patients examples of high blood pressure all the time in my clinic. When I talk about Crohn's disease and say we don't know what the cause is and we don't have a medical cure, you know, we then time out. And the timeout is, let's put this in perspective. This is the same as all other diseases we're treating. We don't know the cause of the vast majority of human ailments. We don't know what causes high blood pressure, but we know that uncontrolled high blood pressure leads to strokes and heart attacks. So we treat it. But once we control high blood pressure, we don't stop therapy. We get it under control, and we keep it under control, and we keep it under control by constant monitoring. We don't let patients intermittently uh, raise their blood pressure along the way. We keep it controlled on a long-term basis. Same with diabetes. We keep it controlled. We maintain, in this uh, case, the uh, target is hemoglobin A1C, and it's been demonstrated that if you maintain normalcy of hemoglobin A1C, you reduce the long-term complications. Rheumatoid arthritis is moving in the same direction. Elimination of inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis has been demonstrated to prevent the progressive joint destruction in patients, and it's a new disease now compared to 20 years ago before the effective therapies for rheumatoid arthritis. So in these um, comparative diseases, we have identified targets that correlate with long-term outcomes of the disease. And the issue is, can we identify these targets in uh, Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis? Now, there was a process to developing these targets. In rheumatoid arthritis, there were a number of algorithms, treatment algorithms that were actually tested in populations of patients, early aggressive versus a reactive approach to patients, the utility of frequent monitoring of both biologic parameters and symptoms that do reflect the course. So joint uh, tenderness actually does reflect a uh, progression of the disease. And then modification along the way at each visit to make certain that the targets are attained and maintained throughout the course. And it's been identified by doing this that early aggressive treatment in rheumatoid arthritis, as I mentioned, can modify the disease course. And here's just an example. It doesn't matter what the parameters are, but in the light blue, you see um, intensive management with careful monitoring of patients and adjusting the doses within three-month intervals of the therapies to achieve their clinical remission was much more effective than routine therapy of administering uh, um, whatever the uh, um, level of treatment was for the individual and then just uh, monitoring them on a yearly basis rather than on a short-term basis. So you can actually uh, treat patients more effectively and it reduces remission, 
but also on this slide in light blue, reduces the progression of radiographic damage. So you can modify the disease course in high blood pressure, in diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis. And this is an example of a patient with early rheumatoid arthritis. On the left at baseline, you just see minimal joint erosion and no joint space narrowing. Well, after two years of biologic therapy, there's been no progression whatsoever of this uh, joint damage. And if you look at a comparative group of individuals not treated aggressively, you definitely see some progression of uh, radiographic evidence. Now, we can see the same thing in inflammatory bowel disease. And just one slide example of um, how our endpoints are making a difference is in individuals who achieve endoscopic healing according uh, with a colonoscopy compared to patients who do not achieve endoscopic healing looking at clinical outcomes such as remissions off steroids or um, uh, not requiring long-term treatment. Early aggressive therapy with elimination of ulcers in addition to symptoms can actually modify the long-term disease activity. The questions we have are what should our targets be in Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis? We know that elimination of symptoms is going to impact on quality of life. Again, that's pretty intuitive. When the patients are feeling better, they're able to uh, engage in activities. We know that laboratory parameters such as C-reactive protein or even as Marla Dubinsky has demonstrated, high um, uh, serologic titers are predictors of disease progression. Should we be targeting these laboratories? Well, we don't think serologies are um, movable, but we can maintain or treat to maintenance of a normal C-reactive protein. And that's become part of our every clinic visit for patients with Crohn's disease is monitoring CRP so that when we see CRP rising, even in the absence of symptoms, we are anticipating that something is going on and looking closely as to whether we should be modifying therapy. I've already emphasized that mucosal healing is an important target. It's not always achievable. The great debates that we have in all these conferences is what do you do in a patient who's asymptomatic but has residual lesions? Should we be advancing class? We don't have data at that point, but we know that it still is an important prognosis. And I like to think in the future we're going to be looking at these com in a composite of a biologic remission. We don't have an individual feature yet, but we're continuing to look for specific factors. So what are the components of this deep or biologic remission? It's elimination of inflammatory symptoms, laboratory evidence of disease, and it's the whole package, getting them better in all manners. And what would be disease modification? Well, it's symptom resolution. It's reduced complications, as we talked about up front. It's reduced long-term disability for our patients. And ultimately, it needs to be improved pharmacoeconomics. And when we apply this to the progression in Crohn's disease, I point out that it's important to identify these patients who are going to have a rapidly progressive course. These are the poor prognosis patients compared to the patients who are going to have a good course and not require intensive therapy because they're not going to develop complications no matter what we do or don't do to them. I've already shown that if we treat early, we have a greater opportunity to prevent the progression. But our intensive therapies right now are aimed at late-term patients where, when the horses are already out of the barn. So our current therapies um, do not really modify the long-term sequelae, mainly because we're treating aggressively too late in the course. Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are similar to other diseases, and we can develop algorithms for treatment along the way, but we need some prospective studies to test these algorithms of early versus late disease that have been identified in post hoc analyses. We need to show these things prospectively. Whereas our current goals of therapy are symptomatic, our future goals are going to be biologic and symptomatic.
and economic. Our goals are to reduce symptoms, but also to maintain remissions and to maintain biologic remissions along the way on a long-term basis, which implies therapeutic monitoring. And just two examples of how even with biologic therapy, there are a number of impacts on the pharmacokinetics of anti-TNF and anti-adhesion molecules. 